I have a lot of skills, but technology is not always one of my strong ones. That's why I'm married up. <laughs> so I'm going to stand over here on this side, though. Um, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, so my name is Lori Marsh. I'm the marketing director here. Many of you have had the opportunity to work with, and I'm just honored that you have come here to join us and learn um, and get some tips from one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to work with Pam for the last six months or so, and I'm delighted to bring her here uh, so that you can have some opportunity to learn something from her. So a couple notes regarding masks. If you have been vaccinated, you are welcome to take them off. I know that it is warm in here. Sally, excellent. You're by the air control. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to keep this baby running. So just keep, 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 it, keep on it to be like. <laughs> So, I love it. I'm going to place people around the world room that can help support this. Um, so um, if you have been vaccinated, feel free to take it off. But please be aware um, and be thoughtful that we do have some residents in this community, some individuals that are not, and they don't have that opportunity to be vaccinated. So we have to be really mindful. Um, let me do something real quick over here. Okay, um, restrooms. If you'd like to use the restroom, head on out this door and curve around to your, your right. Um, around the wall, there's a restroom there. There's also one by the elevator. If you kind of came in from the lobby area and you've been in, on the property before, uh, we have some packets of information, handouts that Pam has provided you um, out in the uh, main area where we came in are my cards and some additional information on the community. If you wanna just reach out to me on a side note afterwards, I'm happy to be able to um, answer any specific questions for you or um, you know, help you out in any other way with resources. I do have some winners of Pam's book and I'm gonna let you know those now so that you can have your book in hand and make your scribbles as desired. Thank you so much for... Um, I want to, yeah. can I say them out loud sure. so that my mind can check them off? Kim Wilson, excellent, wow. right? Lucky row. Uh, Monica Stein, excellent. They are signs are really important to check the inside of where this is where Monica. Yeah. Um, they are signs. Sherry Spear. No Sherry yet? No Sherry. Uh, Sharon Olin. Sharon, excellent. Kathy Moore. Oh, that was yours. Okay. See, that's why I needed to hear it. And Carol Huber. Wonderful, Carol. Thank you so much for registering early um, and, you know, helping to, you know, participate in this program. Um, you, you, you just, yeah. Oh, it's quiet. So for everybody else, um, I'm going to do a little introduction for Pam. And if you have any questions, let me know. Are we good? Okay. Hey, do we feel good about our technology? Not really, but just going. Okay. Let's see. I got power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll just leave all this. Or I hope that that is not making. I got a lot of bling entangled in that microphone that you might be wearing later. Okay. So, again, my name is Lori Marsh. I'm the marketing director here at the summit at Sunland Springs. We have assisted living and memory care. But what is so amazing and exciting is that we have opened our outpatient memory clinic. 
And that means that we are having residents or people in the community be able to come in, receive some of our brain therapy treatments that are in um, our enhanced protocol program and be able to help them uh, work on their cognitive decline while they remain at home, independent with their loved ones. I'll tell you, finding out that there is a history of dementia or Alzheimer's or cognitive decline in your family is very scary. And I think from what I have been able to see, your retirement and your golden years that you're planning with your loved one never, never include a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or something along those lines. And it really stops you in your tracks. And one thing that I've been able to find is the sense of peace and relief to realize research has improved to be able to give us tools to try to help people if they're willing to help themselves. So with that, we have worked on bringing the best minds the best pieces of technology, um, the best opportunities to come and help people improve their memory loss and regain their independence and remain with a quality of life with their loved one as long as possible. So it gives me such honor to be able to introduce Pam Ostrowski. She is the author of It's Not That Simple, Helping Families Navigate the Alzheimer's Journey I have done a number of presentations with her. I have heard her speak her story. And I tell you, it is empowering, humbling, but you come out of it stronger and removing some of the fear and the stigma of what is happening in the world of Alzheimer's. She wrote this amazing book. Now, this is a new copy. This is not my copy. My copy is dog-eared and and written in and post-it notes all over it. I, I thought I would bring a nice one because somebody might end up wanting one, not mine. What I love about it is it's big font and it's amazing, amazing questions that are in the back. Can I get a show of hands of who has actually gotten Pam's book already? Anybody? Yes, we have a few. Fantastic. Um, and I'm sure that you could give a testimony that it is a page turner. You're gonna walk away with some real information to go back to your family members with, whether it be siblings that you're like, okay, where are we gonna do next steps? Or it's your own loved one of like, what are we gonna do next steps? So without further ado, I'm honored to be able to introduce Pam Ostrowski, our presenter. Um, we will have her book signing after the presentation. And so with that, let me introduce Pam. One moment, please. So for our next act, I'm going to do a little tap dance routine. Tap dance routine. Come on, dance. I know how to. We've done this so many times where she's like doing something to entertain people while we do this. She's quite entertaining. She might seem really uh, professional, but she's, she's both professional and... Uh, amazing so as an entertainer all right this does not go with this outfit i'm just saying can we get a white one yeah. so we were in a post office had mom and me and it was a really cool place because it had it was a nursery with a post office in it kind of like the hallmark shops here have them so dad was in line trying to pay a bill. He was probably sixth or seventh in line. And it was um, basically closing time. So they were going, it was a Saturday. Closing time was two. We were there at 155 because as a retired lieutenant colonel, they should not close before two o'clock. Therefore, I can slide in there and make it happen. Okay, dad. Great. So mom and I are like petting the flowers and looking at everything. She's 77 years old. And 
all of a sudden she's like, he's not going to make it. We're not going to be able to pay the water bill. What's going to happen? And I, I was just looking at plants and I was out of the middle of nowhere. And this panic, this anxiety showed up. And I said, he, they're not going to close the door on his face. Have you met him? And I said, it'll be fine. She's like, no, no, it's not going to be fine. And I said, well, even if the water bill gets there a day late, it's okay. No, it's not okay. And so I had to take her face in my hands and say, mom, we've got this. It's okay. Way before we've got this actually had a, a, a title to it. It's like, it's okay. And that was the first time I saw any sort of issue that turned into dementia and then followed into Alzheimer's was that anxiety. So then I started asking questions. My mother was a very refined individual. And so if you asked her, hi, hey, mom, it's Pam. How are you doing? Oh, I am well, thank you. How are you doing, sweetie? Oh, I'm fine. And I'd rattle off for five minutes. Watch that. <laughs> And then I would say, well, so did you guys go out for dinner? Yeah, we had a great time. It was wonderful. These were her top 10 to 12 responses. And if you weren't paying attention, you didn't realize that she was saying the same thing every conversation. So then I figured, okay, I'm a problem solver. Mom, what'd you have for lunch? Oh, you know, I get the same thing every time. New, 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 new. <laughs> That was not my question. What did you have for lunch? She's like, oh, it doesn't matter. So the first tip, and inside your folders, instead of giving you a copy of the slides, which if you want one, you can email me at pam at it's not that simple.com. That's on the cards that are out there, the business cards, inside every chapter of the book. Pretty much you can find me. Or Google my name. I show up. But on here is places for you to take specific notes to the slide deck. So you're not going to write down everything that's on the slide deck, obviously. But it will give you a chance to capture what's most important to you on your journey. Okay? So that's there. And if you don't have a pen, Lori will help you. But everybody should have a pen at this point. So these 10 to 12 phrases were ways for mom to hide her embarrassment, her frustration, and her fear because she was afraid that something was seriously wrong with her. And this was not what they signed up for. And in the book, I talk about a really big outburst of my father with caregivers because they were five minutes late giving mom her medication. Now, the determination, and back me up here, Lori, um, you have a, they have an hour from nine to 10, whatever the schedule is, to administer medications. It was five after nine. And in my dad's viewpoint, her medication should have been given to her at exactly nine o'clock. And I asked him from a logistical perspective, Colonel, how would that happen that they could distribute all of the medications at the exact time to 55 residents? He said, it doesn't matter. My wife is first. Okay, dad, what's really going on? And he said, you just don't understand. He was a big waiver. I don't know if that was a World War II thing. That's just like, you just don't understand. Okay. Help me understand. You're never here, dad. I'm here three times a week. I email the staff every day. They know my dog's names. That's how well this place knows me. Lori is blessed, as is the memory care community, that we weren't here. <laughs> um, and so we... I said, what is going on? And he sighed and got really sad and said, this is not the way it was supposed to be. And I said, oh, and like Don's, because as a daughter, I understood what he meant. No, this was my best friend that could no longer speak. So mom's journey went from 2001, August, I moved them out here. I packed them up, found them the Woodmark over in Sun City because that's where they wanted to be. Actually, no. In 2001, they moved to, um, they were in the West Valley at West, West, Westbrook Village. Um, so they had a, con a condo. Dad had no idea what was going on with mom when it first started. 
So they lived there for six years. And then in August of 2007, we moved into assisted living slash independent living because dad was still independent. Love that combination. So the challenge then became um, with, you know, in 2010, she pretty much shut down and she went on vocal in 2008. By going non-vocal, what that means is that she would no longer be able to have our long conversations with me. That's what it meant to me. So let's see if we can't, don't get emotional. <laughs> um, but when you see this happen to someone, it's heartbreaking. And then all you can think about is how horrible you feel. And in the meantime, they're sitting there like, well, I just made you sad. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is with communications, um, I signed the books, Every Moment Matters. And the reason why is because we don't know how many moments we get. Everybody's number is different. And we don't know how many moments we get being healthy versus like something not quite working right as we age. The good news is dementia is not a given. You know, it's all about diet and exercise and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to leave that conversation to Lori because that's what the memory clinic is all about. But it really is about how we create emotional joy in every moment. It's not about arguing about who's right. It's not, it's about, not by arguing about a memory that you have because that's the killer. Because you make that person sad because, no, I don't remember that I have three granddaughters and that one of them just graduated from college. I don't remember that. So then that makes them sad and you get frustrated. So you keep trying to correct them. So let's talk a bit about some of the behaviors. Um, eventually I will figure out which way this is supposed to go. There we go. All right. I'm going to say a sentence and I want all of you to repeat it out loud to me. We are going to go to the restaurant but first, we're going to stop by the dry cleaners and pick up their clothes. Then we're going to go to the bank and we're going to open a checking account. And then we're going to go eat. Please start. So I use that as an example because I actually, I run the support group here for the memory clinic. And there was some frustration by one of the people because he said, I don't understand why she's so angry with me. I told her we were going to go eat, but we had to stop at the bank and the restaurant, the, uh, the dry cleaners first. And I said, did you say that all in one sentence by chance? <laughs> well, yeah, why? Because to us, that's normal. And honestly, it was hard for me to remember what I said. <laughs> so there's always going to be that challenge. And um, we really want to realize some really key and easy tips. But first, let's talk about what we call the struggle. It's such a struggle to communicate with mom or dad or your spouse. Uh, it, and so... What I'm going to encourage you to do in the next couple of slides is actually talk to your mindset. You are walking into their world now. You're no longer in yours. I suggest you do that in the parking lot if your loved one lives in a care community, at the parking lot or their driveway, but depending on where they live. You have to readjust your attitude and your mindset. So, I lived this. So, uh, you know, my mom would say to my dad, now I'm going to introduce something, a couple of concepts here. It's the way I speak. I apologize, but I'm going to introduce a lot of information to you all at once. And then if you want to cover anything particular, write down your question and we'll cover it at the end. So they feel that the aging person is not listening. My mother's favorite phrase was, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? Well, Dad had, was 90% deaf. Now, an aside, write this down, Dementia Untangled. It's a podcast by Banner Alzheimer's Institute. It's really good. And one of the podcasts is about the effect hearing loss has on creating dementia symptoms or dementia. 
the brain science behind it is pretty fascinating. Basically, long story short, um, your brain is so focused on hearing the words that it doesn't actually process the information and the meaning to, of the cognition of what the word means. And therefore, your, you, your brain gives up. It's like, it's too hard. I'm not doing this. I'm going to go off and think about something else. So they tune out, become less social, less engaged. And, and that's very much the dementia cycle. So that's the first misrepresentation. We believe that if we repeat ourselves, did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Right? Louder. Talk louder. So one communications tip is if somebody doesn't respond to the words, did you, do you hear me? Don't repeat it. Try a different set of words. Because with, with dementia and specifically with Alzheimer's, it, um, the amyloid plaques and tau proteins affect different parts of the brain. And guess what? Just to make it more fun, it's different parts of the brain for every individual. So even though my mom went non-vocal, your mom may not. Or else may not. So it all depends on where those sticky little proteins and plaques are as to what areas of your, um, your brain function. And the definition of dementia, by the way, is, and that's in the book, um, is two or more conditions. Two or more, it's a condition of where two or more brain functions are disabled. So then there's this. This is actually my uh, enemy number one. There's nothing wrong with him. He's fine. That's what my dad was saying about my mom. She's fine. We don't need to move. You know, we're fine. We've paid off everything. I'm not going to rent an apartment again. We own this place. All the things until we finally, I checked the kitchen. This is also in the book. Um, and there wasn't any salads. There weren't any vegetables. There was White Castle freezer burned probably. Uh, hamburgers in the freezer and milk and cereal and soup. That's not good enough nutrition. That's another big factor in how the brain functions and how well it can function based on what you're feeding it and how well you're hydrating it. And then our expectations as family members that we're doing just fine communicating, it's you. You know, we're, why don't you understand that this is Susie standing next to me or in, in mild cognitive impairment, more of no, and I, my best friend just is saying, I told mom, that that's not the way this happened. And I said, would it be okay? Would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? <laughs> that's my favorite saying in that book is, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? For some reason, we as humans seem to think that we have to be right. And we're arguing with someone who's 20 or 30 years older than we are. For some reason, it's important and it's not. Let it go. That's the second most popular phrase in my book. So lastly, a lack of knowledge. And, and I praise you all and thank you all for coming here today because this is the first step to understanding how to communicate with someone with dementia or Alzheimer's. So I get a lot of, well, what about me? And what about my feelings? And I understand but the question is, are you really struggling with the other person? Or is it that you just want them to be who they used to be? And that's the hard mindset change that you have to make before you enter a room, enter the building, because ultimately it's about the relationship. And so you'll hear most people who take care of someone at home say, I'm exhausted. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. He doesn't treat me like his wife or his hu or her husband or the daughter or the son anymore. And now I'm this caregiver. And that's not what I signed up for. And I'm resentful and I'm angry and I'm frustrated. So those are the people that I talk with. That's the services I provide. We sit down and we have those conversations. And they're hard conversations to have but I've lived it for 14 years. So I know what it feels like. And those emotions are impactful. And how you respond in this situation, you pretty much only get one chance, meaning that every day is different. But 
you've got to learn to change your mindset when you talk with someone with dementia or any cognitive impairment. So that means you have to manage your expectations because ultimately, if you don't manage your expectations, those remaining years are going to be filled with frustration, anger, sadness, grief. And that grief thing, I'm thinking about writing a second book about that one because it's big. Because as you're watching this person change, and by the way, just to mix it up a little more, if it's not a complicated enough disease already, some days they'll appear completely normal. So I walked in, my mom had been non-vocal for four, year, four or five years. I don't remember exactly. And I walked into the activity center and my mom had been doing something. That was stimulating her brain, by the way. And she looked up at me and said, hi, Pammy. <laughs> I didn't know whether to burst into tears or hug her or what to do. She had not said my name since 2007. And it was at least 2012. And to hear her voice, it gives me chills right now. Um, and so they do have in and outs. Probably the best advice I can give you is that that person that you know and love is still in there. They didn't disappear somehow. The disease didn't stop the inside of who they are. It touched their inability to communicate and process tasks. That's the big, biggest one, honestly. Um, and when people say, oh, well, dad's so angry. Well, that might be because like with my mom, if she pushed somebody away, she wasn't being violent. She couldn't speak. And so I'm starting to do caregiving conversations from a family member perspective to say, she's not being vocal. She's not being violent. She's not pushing you away for, there's something wrong. She doesn't want you to do something, which means there's probably a bruise or, um, you know, maybe she's uncomfortable. You know, let's figure out what the problem is. So it's about empathy and understanding and taking your time. So as we age, we, this is another example from, from the support group is as we age, it takes us longer to respond because, you know, I just went through the, you know, going to the restaurant for the, but first we have to go to the dry cleaners and then to the bank and then we're going to go eat. So, see, I remember that. Um, <laughs> I'm a vocal learner. Um, so the, the, the thing about that is that if we keep our sentences simple, and we're going to talk about this, and focus on happy emotions, moments of joy, then we are going to be much better off in how we all interact and the memories that you create. Because these are the last years. These are the last moments. You get to choose how they go down, how they, how, what this experience looks like. And when I said earlier about you only get kind of one chance, I didn't have any idea what I was doing. For 14 years, I was like, here's a disease nobody knows anything about because it was 2001 to 2015 when mom passed. Now, by 2010, we had people like Tika Snow and you had you know, some more Alzheimer's associations started actually having a website and you were able to access more information. The Alzheimer's Foundation of America also came into the picture. They were all around, but there was really no communications mechanism for us to you know, search and find more information. So you're, you were on your own. The good news is, is that we now have an infrastructure in place to help you understand the complexities, under, have someone to talk with about, I don't understand why this is all happening. I said this, that happened. And so this, this exercise that I did, the don't ramble on, it's one thing at a time. Let's go get ice cream, period. Okay, I like ice cream. Great. Get your coat. Okay, I'll go get my coat. But it isn't that long list of things because all they're either going to pick up is the very front, which... <laughs> Go eat, I think I heard you say. Uh, and, and so the question would then be, if you're going to go eat, they may or may not make, so I'm going to use my mom as an example, they may or may not make the connection with that means I need to go get my coat. Or in this case, 
an air conditioner. <laughs> Getting a coat right now in this weather would not be good, but a purse or a wallet or whatever it might be. So they're, they're not making those connections. And we get frustrated because we want this person to be who they were five or 10 years ago when they knew what I was saying, because we're in such a rush. And I remember asking this woman in the support group, I asked her a question and her husband immediately answered for her. And I said, whoa, let her answer. It's her question. Because how many times in any relationship do we not interrupt each other all the time and finish each other's sentences? And we're proud of that. Hey, I know you well enough to answer the question for you. Yeah, and maybe not. My first husband thought that. <laughs> See where he ended up. So rather, and, and so because of that cognitive slowdown, you have to give another individual. Everybody in this room should be giving everyone else 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Let the person answer the question for heaven's sakes. Give them time. Listen to how they're responding. One of the things I wish I could have back is my mom's voice because she was, her voice was gone for so long and she would babble, but that, that wasn't no intonation, no, no voice. I only have a few recordings because back in the day, of course, we didn't have smartphones. So, and we didn't have a camcorder or anything. So it, I had just have two or three really short recordings. So another tip that has nothing to do with this presentation is anytime you're with your loved one, turn on that camera. I mean, it's not about being camera shy. Those videos aren't going to go anywhere. Who cares what you look like on video? And have, if nothing else, haven't we learned that from 2020? You know, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> We're no longer camera shy. So it's really important, though, that you capture that person as even as they progress. Um, I have um, a video of mom just a few days before she died because I put headphones on her. This is when it was brand new, right? 20, 2015. So the, the, um, uh, and I, it's in the book, but it's, uh, it, it's about the mu how music was the first scientist who found out about music and how it impacts memory. And the fact that memory, I was listening to the radio and don't judge me. Um, David Cassidy from the Partridge family was singing. I think I love you. I knew every single word and I have not heard that song in 30 years. And I thought, Okay, that's what does that say about me? <laughs> I mean, uh, why couldn't I have picked a different song? <laughs> However, I put those headphones on mom's head and I turned on my iPod and she started swinging her arms and her feet went back and forth. And I think it was Dean Martin, that's Amore. And she just had her eyes closed and she was just dancing with dad. And so that was huge, but I have a video of that. So at the very end, so capture those moments. We have the technology to do that. Um, and then probably another one that's most important is don't argue with them. Is that the memory you want to have? Is it how you argued with somebody about whether they were right or wrong once they're gone? You don't want that memory, trust me. I have lots of memories of dad and me because the apple does not fall far from that tree. And, and yeah, I, there's, there's moments I regret. So how do you speak differently? Okay, first of all, avoid getting frustrated. If, if they're asking the same question repeatedly, that's a tough one to say, oh, dear God, the dog's name is Sierra. And, and you know what? You just have to mix it up a little bit. The dog's name Spot, the dog's name Scout, the dog's name, yeah, because they're not going to remember and they're going to ask you that question. Now, what's fascinating, I walked into mom's care community with my two dogs, Scout and Sierra. <laughs> See, I didn't pick those names out of the middle of nowhere. Um, and three or four people yelled, Buster, George, Harry. I mean, and, and the dogs are like, nope, keep trying. <laughs> Not my name, not my name. And, and they're, they're obedience um, dogs, they're a service dogs, so they know not to not respond to anybody but me. But um, it, it was just fascinating that everybody remembered their dog's names. It didn't matter what the dog looked like. It had fur and four legs and a nose and a little, you know, you know, little spots or whatever. Didn't matter. So pick those moments of joy. I used to take popcorn 
and my dogs would sit and I would throw popcorn at them. And that we had an entire circle of people and they, they just loved it. Those are moments of joy. I had a woman, a daughter call me and say, COVID's over. I'm going to go see my mom. What do I talk to her about? There's nothing going on around our grandkid, her grandkids. I was like, wow, that was your plan <laughs> to talk about what the grandkids are doing. Do you think she would have engaged or remembered any of that? No. I said, go grab a pot of, a potted plant and pick the petals off of a daisy. I mean, I, it, whatever you're doing, you know, do painting, do um, count buttons, fold laundry, you know, who can't use someone to help you fold your laundry. So it's doing something where you can build that relationship back, doing things that preoccupy the mind, but also allow you to just talk about nothing. Frankly, it doesn't matter. It's your voice, your tone. It's the emotion that you have with that loved one. It's that compassion. They want to, they want to be with you. They don't need you even to talk. So someone was saying, oh, well, I bring photographs in and I try to help mom remember something. Well, okay. <laughs> um, and sometimes she's really good and sometimes she's not. Okay. How does that make you feel? Well, I'm trying to help. Okay. Wh what are you thinking is going to happen? Well, it might help her get better. No. So that's the other part of mindset is that we want to keep the brain as active as possible. We want to take into account as many things as possible to help them have the best quality of life, to live with dignity and respect. But if you think that showing them pictures and labeling the pictures is going to make a significant difference in their situation, in their condition, that's not going to happen. And that's another thing that I do is we kind of walk through some of those difficult emotions about this doesn't get better. It, you can mitigate the condition. You can help with something like the memory clinic um, to mitigate the, the condition. Um, you can see improvement, but it's not necessarily going to get better. Now, the difference here is, is that there's also pseudodementia affected by toxins in our water and our foods, um, uh, medication interactions that affect and also present just like dementia. So that's one of the challenges that we have. Only 16% of doctors in the United States actually give anyone over the age of 65 a memory test. So that means you guys are on your own. So rather than doing a memory test, let's take a look at what you're eating, how hydrated you are. My dad used to say, I don't know where he got this phrase. I actually, I think it was his dad that said it first. I said, dad, you should drink some more water. He said, oh, it rusts your pipes. <laughs> I'm like, Okay. So he would drink very little. I swear that man was dehydrated his entire life. So it's those things. I don't want to scare you about the, the dementia, uh, but, but if you're thinking that the changing photographs is going to make a difference, instead, get more fruits and vegetables. Make sure that they're drinking their water. Check their medications. Look at the supplements that they're using. They could be using the wrong supplements, which could create brain fog and other issues. So you want to get that, get a lab test for those things. All of those things affect your health and well-being of your brain. So for those people who, does anybody have someone in their life that has Alzheimer's or? Okay. So um, the thing about Alzheimer's is that they're not focused. Usually it's kind of a blur. So what I would do is walk up and say, hi, mom, how are you today? It's Pam, your daughter. So you have to put, you have to get in their field of vision. You can't say, hey, mom, it's Pam. And the other thing you never want to do is stand back here and talk over her. So how are you doing today? Mom's sitting there going, you know, who, who's she talking to? So it's so easy to do that, though, where you would have a conversation with a caregiver over your loved one. They're still in there and they're wondering what's wrong with you. And I'm sure my mother thought, I've taught you better than this. <laughs> so um, depending on your loved one and uh, how they learn, when you're doing something, an activity with your loved one, these are the things that are important for helping them remember things. Because in mild cognitive impairment and early dementia, that's when there seems to be the most frustration with the loved one. 
between the two of you, it's just a one big argument. She's not listening. He's not talking to me. Um, she doesn't know what he's talking about. And so there's four ways that we communicate. This is also in the book. Visual, audible, read, write. So if you read something, are you better at, at cognitively remembering it? And then finally, kinesthetic, which involves the body. So when you're talking with them, it's important to pay attention to, okay, what was it? When mom registered something or dad registered something or my spouse registered something, what was the trigger? And this can evolve, by the way. So just because they were a visual learner at one point, um, they might be different now and be audible. So test all of them. And frankly, the more the merrier. But for the tips that I give to the support group, are usually around, we're going to the doctors at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Then you write it down, doctor, 10 a.m. And then you hand it to them and say, can you read that out loud to me? Yeah, doctor, 10 a.m. Okay. Can you write it down too? Doctor, 10 a.m. So now they have an example, doctor, and they may be copying it. They may not be processing it like you would, you and I would. And what happens there is we've just imprinted on the brain in long-term memory in three or four different ways. Because when you write something or you read something, there's a voice in your head. You ever notice that? It's, it's reading to you in your voice. It's called sub vocalization. And so that's another hidden way that we start to remember what's happening. So This is really important. As decline happens, don't instruct. So especially with Alzheimer's, it's the task-based things, the processing of how you do something. So a person that I know with dementia, um, he will, it, this comes up with people saying, oh, well, I set down my glasses, but I can't remember where I put them. It, for us, it has more to do with the fact that we're not paying attention, we're multitasking, we're not focused. So if you really want to remember where your glasses are, where your wallet is, set it, set, whenever you set it down, say, I'm setting this on the kitchen counter. And your brain's like, oh, we're setting it on the kitchen counter. All right, keep that. That's going to be important later when she says she can't find it. So um, instead, act it out if you can. So mom had uh, a fall. They were worried there was, might be a hip fracture. That's like everybody's worst nightmare. So we went to the hospital. And they put her in an MRI machine. Can you imagine what that's like? She's non-vocal. She doesn't know what's happening. And, um, and the nurse, so in Arizona, nurses are not trained on dementia and Alzheimer's. In Massachusetts, they are, but they only get 18 hours of training on it. So don't expect anybody in the medical profession to know what they're doing when it comes to your loved one and how they communicate. Doctors and nurses should be in here, by the way, listening to this. Next, next presentation. Work, work on that, Lori, will you? Uh, <laughs> but the, so what I did with mom is I said, lay down. And she knew that that's the way she used to put me to bed. She said, time to go sleepy town. And so I laid, you know, she laid down and then I helped her get positioned and she didn't fight it. And then they took all my jewelry off of me and I put my hand on her knee. And so she knew I would be there the entire time. There's a lot of care and time that goes into taking care of someone who can't vocalize. And there isn't anybody else there to do it for them. I was there for my mom. My dad never would have understood what we were trying to do. And he's like, I, he would have said, I told her to lay down five times and she wouldn't do it, right? It's, and if you take away anything from this talk, it's that... You've got to approach this differently. It's a different mindset. They can't. It's not that they don't want to. They're not being stubborn. They can't. So go for the things that they have that do work. And instead, make moments of joy. Find the things that register with them. And keep that as a positive experience. Know that they have good days and bad days. So just because yesterday was hell doesn't mean tomorrow will be. Give them a break. Now, you may need a break. I have one gentleman, a client right now, 
And I, he texted me and he's like, I see mom every day. And I thought, I bet the care community just loves you <laughs> because what's happening there is disruption. He comes in at lunchtime. His mom was fine. Sees her son. He, I don't know their situation quite yet to know if she recognizes him every time, but then he leaves and he, he helicopters in and then helicopters back out. And it's like, you just disrupted her day. She was fine going to activities, listening to music, you know, that whole luxury cruise, docked cruise liner um, that Lori uses. Um, I mean, this place is spectacular. I want to move in. They won't let me. Um, but it's, her day is full. It's exciting. It's fun. It's stimulating. She's making new friends. Oh, here's my son. I have to be somebody different for my son. So you don't need to visit every day. But when you do, focus on moments of joy. And if your voice, you know, sometimes um, I had one uh, example where my mom and I were in the hallway and this gentleman's leaving his dad. And he says, I'll see you on Sunday, dad. Dad says, is Sunday tomorrow? He's like, no, dad. Sunday isn't like four days from now. So I can feel that argument coming and I can feel the angst and, uh, in both people. And he's like, Sunday, dad, you know, Sunday. And I just wanted to grab the sun and say, can we talk for a moment? <laughs> Let's just walk this way. Because that gentleman, and, and thank God for trained caregivers, the caregiver saw the same thing I did. And as soon as the sun started to walk away and you could see this crestfallen face of, I failed. I don't know what Sunday is. I don't even know what today is. I don't know what month it is. I don't know what temperature it is outside. And they feel failure and sadness and grief at losing. And, and they upset their loved one. And in his mind, you know, I want to go slap the sun, but he's feeling like he caused it. And the caregiver saw the whole thing, grabbed him and said, come on, George, let's go get some ice cream. Do you want hot fudge? And, and just immediately, and, and the good news is, is that you can redirect. That's what that's called. Um, you can redirect really quickly and successfully pick anything. doesn't matter what it is. Get them out of that mood. That's not fair. They're stuck there. We need to get them out. So if you start to get frustrated, leave. Jeez. So I'm going to quickly go through these next couple of things. Um, and then if you, again, if you want the slides, just email me. Uh, but everything in here is covered in the book. That'll make it easy. And uh, so the, if you're going to do an outing, first of all, I would say have it here or have, I mean, you have it at your care community, have it at home, bring everybody in because they know that area and, and they know where to go to hide because they want me a quiet time. If you take them to a restaurant, it's overwhelming. It's, and that's why Mesa is actually working on becoming dementia friendly with businesses. And uh, <laughs> So uh, is to make that less noisy and less bright and less, and, and like my mom would look at a menu and say, well, and, and she would just stare at it. And my dad wouldn't even pick up on the visual cue that she wasn't processing. And I'd say, mom, why don't we get the salmon and split it? You would like salmon, I think. She was like, oh, that would be good. So he left her in that state again because of denial. She wasn't supposed to be like this. So you want someone who's a full-time companion and you want them to, the family to be prepared because everybody needs to know if the grandchild walks up and says, grandma, it's so good to see you. And, and grandma doesn't know who you are or grandma's having a bad day. And she might say, you're a brat. Now she may be speaking the truth by the way, but, but uh, we have a filter as adults and uh, they lose that filter. So they might say something that might be offensive. So everybody needs to know what they're signing up for when they come for a visit. Uh, and of course, give them a place to escape to. When you're greeting and leaving, this is really important. So I showed you the greeting with Robin, where you go down to eye level and introduce yourself at your relationship and your name. And by using mom, she knew, okay, I'm her mom. But visitors, oh my gosh, visiting day was always Sunday. Everybody shows up on Sundays and with hordes of people, there's like three grandchildren, two sisters, a brother, and that's just overwhelming. Two people makes it easy. And same introduction. 
if you do have a horde of people that need to come in for a birthday, like mom never knew when her birthday was, it didn't matter. So don't get wrapped up on holidays either. You know, I used to put Christmas stuff up and Easter stuff up and Valentine's Day stuff up because that's what, what I grew up with. That was for me, you know, and she liked the chocolates I brought on Valentine's Day though. But it, it, it's not, it's important to us. We have to ask ourselves every day, is this important to me or is it important to them? And then if it's important to you, determine what it is that you want from this experience. Label it. Okay, I'm looking for recognition. I'm looking for comfort. I'm looking for love. I'm looking to see if she's safe. I'm looking to see if she's clean. Whatever your thing is that you're looking for, pay attention to that. Um, and then leaving. Okay, this one's really bad. This is really hard. Get really guilty. Um, and guilt is right underneath denial in the emotions. Um, so I never told mom I was leaving. I would always say, I've got to go take the dogs out. I'll be back. And that's true. I was taking the dogs out and I would be back in three days. Um, and, or I'll see you later. Any of those things are fine, but do not say like that gentleman did. I'll be back on Sunday. First of all, he called it a, a, a day, a name. That means it's not going to be soon. So even if they're, if they're even mildly, you know, um, cognizant of what they're saying, that individual is saying, it's like, well, that's a long time away. And um, always say, I love you. You never know how long you have to say that. And that goes for every age group, by the way. Um, and take care of yourselves. If you're taking care of someone, you're probably exhausted, potentially depressed because you have might not be reaching out for support. There is so much support. So right before this, poor everybody else was let in. What's your name? Marie. Marie, um, Marie snuck in here as did this gentleman. And, um, and she said, hey, do you know anybody who can do in-home care? So uh, I gave her two names. I gave her phone numbers. And now Marie can help her friend. So get help. If you need help, reach out to me. Ask me if I know anybody. Ask Lori. Lori knows tons of people. So we're all in this industry to help each other and help everyone who's suffering from this condition and potentially Alzheimer's disease. Um, you don't need to do this journey alone. That's what my marketing that rack card that you saw says. You don't need to do this alone. Um, it, it can. So I, I didn't share the statistics with you, but caregivers of people with dementia and Alzheimer's it have suffered from chronic conditions about 20 to 30% higher than those of caregivers of non-dementia, non-Alzheimer's uh, individuals, and then even uh, more so than those who aren't caregivers. So meaning that the top ones are cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, 20 to 30% higher. So your caregiving is killing you. Is that what your loved one would really want? No, of course not. So this is me because I did icons because for the people who are visual learners, um, Pam at it's not that simple.com. And um, you can schedule a free 30 minute consult with me just to chat, kind of get to know each other because I work with individuals, family members who are on this journey, walk through everything that you're going through because I made mistakes. I don't want you to go through that. And you're, you're not going to have an opportunity to fix some things that you wish you had. So I'm here to say, let me help you. Let Lori help you. Um, you can go to my Facebook page where I have either announcements of more different topics that I talk about. Oh, and I also put lots of tips there. And then YouTube is the lovely Lori Marsh and I, I have several videos with her talking about different topics, uh, as well as I have done, I've spoken for the Alzheimer's Foundation of America and several other organizations. So um, that continues, everything continues to be updated, of course, with the latest information. So um, if you have any questions, then this is a good place to start or send me an email. Uh, does anybody have any questions right now or we'll wrap up and I want to hand off something to, to you guys. Don't get packed up quite yet. We have something really important for you to hear about. Any questions? 
overwhelmed. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, I'm, I'm one of those uh, information-packed individuals. So you may be sitting there going, oh, dear God in heaven, I hope this doesn't happen to me. It doesn't have to. And it can be mitigated and altered by some of the things that I've mentioned. Yes. So dementia, good question. It's chapter one. Um, it, the um, dementia is an overall condition. There's 70 different types of dementia. The most prominent one is Alzheimer's at 60 to 80% of those diagnosed with dementia, followed by vascular dementia and Lewy body dementia and then frontal temporal dementia, and then drifts off into smaller percentages. So Alzheimer's is actually a disease. And it's a disease of two proteins, amyloid beta protein and tau protein, that accelerate in the brain in growth and start interfering with the, the synapse connection across the neurons. The neurons die. And it's a random, random type of event. In other words, you don't know where the neurons are going to go, where, where they're going to die. So it could be in speech. It could be in task. It could be in behaviors. It could be in skills, you know, any of those types of things. But that's a disease. The dementia is just a condition that is an overarching two or more brain functions are no longer um, working properly. And it's interfering with daily activities. That's the other half of what dementia is, is it's interfering with your ability to live your life in a normal way, what we would consider to be a normal way with daily activities. Okay, is that help? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. My mom was in memory training. How do I respond when she said, why did you put me here? Why am I here? And I say, because you need this semester help. And she says, no, I don't. Right. So this is the equivalent of I want to go home. Uh, <laughs> so just to clarify two things. I want to go home, by the way, has nothing to do with the building that you grew up in. It has nothing to do with a home per se. Um, it has to do with when you, all right, everybody think of home. Like when you grew up, you're thinking of everybody knew everybody, you know, you, you knew the kitchen table, you knew all of these things that they were familiar and comforting. When they say they want to go home, they want to go back to where their brain was. They're very cognizant of the fact the brain is not there anymore. And so they say, I want to go home. It, it's not a building. It's, and, and I know that we do this when we move into memory care. We always put all the stuff, photos and memorabilia and all their favorite things. And they don't know what the hell those things are, people. They don't know what this little tchotchke is. They, they, they don't even know that it, it has supposed to have meaning. So we do that for us. So when she says, why did you put me here? That's an opportunity for a redirect. And you could say something as kind as, because I love you and I want you to be safe. Um, and because if you go down the path of care, now you're there and they internalize criticism for some reason. I don't know medically why that is, but to her, that's a criticism that you're my daughter. You do not tell me when I need care. You are totally wrong. So instead, are you getting that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so the way to handle that would be instead to say, because I love you. Now let's go get some ice cream and, and or, or whatever, you know, this there. Or, you know, let's go listen to some music. Um, and then if nothing else, you can always use. Um, so so the, the way that we, we talk about... Um, assisted living and memory care, I, I think we really mess it up. And a lot of times people say, oh, it's a nursing home. I like Lori's representation of it, where it really is a docked luxury cruise liner, where they're getting stimulation for their brains, their bodies, they're getting socialization that they wouldn't normally get. And so being able to redirect is so much easier having her here to go preoccupy her mind but she feels most likely uncertain because, you know, you've got those hills and valleys on her good days. She doesn't know why she's there. That's because most of your days aren't good days, mom, because you can't be left at home. But the easiest way to explain it is because I love you. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? <clears throat> that must be my cue, Lori, to hand off. <laughs> Outside, 
signing books and selling books and answering any questions that you would like. Thank you so much, Pam. I learn something from her every single time I hear the presentation. There's always a unique perspective, a unique story that I use every day when I walk into our memory care community, not to mention some of the other residents that we have. So I think we all can learn a little bit about just having a little bit more grace and coming, approaching memory loss from um, a different perspective instead of the person that we knew before, but meeting them where they're at now. Um, I wanted to share a couple things about uh, the summit and some other upcoming programs that we have inside your packet. There is a flyer here. If you're missing it, I have extras. It is a couple more presentations we're having in August. One of them is with our fantastic um, medical providers, A Mind for All Seasons, is avoiding the task trap. A lot of times when you have a loved one, you're trying to work through um, getting them to help do something and you're getting caught in the weeds. This is um, a great presentation to learn how to navigate through those requests. Um, you'll get an email invitation if you've attended this to give you a little bit more information on that. Another one is um, if you've gotten a dementia diagnosis, what comes next? This is in conjunction with Oakwood Creative Care a fantastic resource where it is a day program. Uh, if you have a loved one with some cognitive decline, you can take them there and they have a, a stimulating environment where you're still, they're still at um, living at home, but then maybe you're needing to do appointments or um, go to work still, but this is an opportunity for them to have an engaging experience. That's Oakwood Creative Care. And then on Tuesday, August 24th, we have another great presentation with our medical partners and mind for all seasons in mild cognitive decline. It's not mild. Um, we really are trying to change the way people are looking at cognitive decline, that if you got a diagnosis, a cancer diagnosis, and someone said you have stage one cancer, you wouldn't be sitting back going, okay, good. I'll just wait till really it gets bad and then we'll do something about it. You would be in a proactive treatment, working through it to navigate that. For some reason, we hear, oh, you have mild cognitive impairment. And you go, okay, I'll just take them home. And we'll just, we'll just sit it out for a couple more years. Well, the alternative is doing something about it. So that's what we really introduced our memory clinic for, being able to assist people um, with that impairment, impairment by taking them through our program, there's a flyer out in the uh, other room, kind of shows you the step-by-step -step of what the memory clinic is, the enhanced program, enhanced protocol program. And um, one of the, the fundamentals is it's searching for the root causes of cognitive decline. Just because there is a history in your family does not mean that you are destined or somebody is destined to get it. So much of what is uh, created by the cognitive decline and memory loss is what we've done to our bodies already or continue to do with the American diet. And there are things you can do. You would be surprised how much hormones come into play. Uh, deficiencies in nutrients come into play. And if you're even able to go through some of the lab work in this program, you're able to find out maybe there's some things that I can do. I'll tell you on a personal note, I did my lab work um, recently, and I was I was surprised. Um, I haven't even told my husband yet because I just kind of still processing that I have one of the genes that would be a marker for having Alzheimer's. Right? That's kind of like that's a surprise, but. I also have a little mutation of another gene. I also have some hormones that are tanking. So I also have some thyroid issues. Okay, well, you look at me and you think she's fine, she's fit, she's under 50, she's got it all. But underlying, there's some things going on. Now, initially, I put my head in the sand and I went, wow, that was a little bit more information than I wanted and I don't know how to handle it. 
And then I came out of the, the head in the sand and I said, now I can do something with it. I have information that I can go and change the trajectory of my future. So I will be doing programs. I will be looking into figure out what I can do to improve my next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Because I owe that to my husband, my daughter, and the rest of my family. So if you want some more information on what the program is or on the community um, or even just some additional resources, please uh, grab my business card. We can talk on a personal level, uh, hang around, we can talk, but I would love to be able to be a resource for you, okay? Thank you so much, that's all I have. I've run out of my words. Thank you for everybody online.